of service today. Today is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, and today we see how uh, uh, the, that faith should give evidence of itself in our lives. Sometimes that evidence, uh, outside, sometimes evidence outside of ourselves or outside of our control, can challenge that faith. And the fact that Christ lives and lives in us. Uh, the fact that he rules all things for our good is no guarantee that we're not going to face fear or disaster, things that challenge our faith. In fact, the opposite is true. He, he promises that we will face uh, troubles in this life. So this Sunday, our readings show us one particular aspect of faith, that we trust in him when all outward evidence argues against trusting in him. We follow the order of service found in your service folder. We begin with our opening prayer. The Lord bless your worship this morning. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit that through the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing our first hymn, hymn number 353. Our sins are a grievous foe which we should hate, 
in every way as long as we live. O oh, merciful God, you still grant us in this hour to be reminded of your fatherly goodness. According to the promise of your word, we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy and implore you, dearest Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised again for our justification. Forgive us all our sins through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts to full assurance. We therefore pray, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins.
from the 27th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning with the 13th verse. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they could carry out their plan. They raised the anchor, they sailed close to the shore of Crete. But before long, a hurricane-like wind, called the Northeaster, rushed down from the island. Since the ship was caught in it and could not heed, or could not head into the wind, he gave way, we gave way to it and were driven along. As we sailed on the sheltered side of a small island called Cauda, we were, were barely able to secure the skiff. After hoisting it on board, the men tied ropes around the ship to reinforce it. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the, the sea anchor in a way that would, that, uh, in, in this way, were driven along. Because we were tossed around so violently by the storm the next day, they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's gear overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the violent storm kept pressing down on us, finally all hope we would be saved was disappearing. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood among them and said, Men, you should have followed my advice and not set sail from Crete and avoid this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because there will be no loss of life among you. Only the ship will be lost. In fact, last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do, you, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. And surely God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, because I believe, God, that it will be exactly the way I have told you. However, you must run aground on some island. Here ends our second lesson. Please rise for the reading of our gospel lesson, the fourth chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the 35th verse. This will also serve as our sermon text this morning. On that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side. After leaving the crowd behind, the disciples took him along in the boat, just as he was. Other small boats all also followed him. A great windstorm arose, and waves were splashing into the boat, so that the boat was quickly filling up. Jesus, Jesus himself was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. They woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to drown? Then he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind stopped, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still lack faith? They were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obeys him. Here ends the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God be Lord and giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
to fade away. Does Jesus care? You and your spouse have been trying and praying for a child for a long, long time. You'd be great parents. The doctor doesn't really know what's wrong. And yet, every time you go on Facebook or other social media, you find another birth announcement. And of course, you're happy for them. Your friend, your co-worker, your cousin, your own sister, but you also don't know how much more you can take. Does Jesus really care? You know your kids and your grandkids are busy. They have so much going on in their lives right now. And you know that they love you and that they care about you and just wish that they would just take an hour out of their schedule and come by and visit or maybe even just call. It's been months since you've seen anyone stop by. Does Jesus care? You feel like you're doing the right things in your marriage. You put your spouse first, you're kind, you try to be patient, yet it seems like he doesn't care or appreciate you at all. You feel trapped. Does Jesus care? No one understands your pain. You're not even sure if you do. But no matter what, you always feel like you're not good enough. You feel insignificant. You feel empty. Like life just isn't worth living anymore. Does Jesus care? You're in the doctor's office after years of being cancer-free for nothing more than your annual check-in. The doctor looks at you, he looks at your spouse, and simply says, I'm sorry, but it's bad. Does Jesus care? Are you in a does Jesus care moment? If not now, probably been. We all. The gospel from Mark chapter 4 shares the disciples does Jesus care moment. The disciples have been with Jesus for several months at this by this time. They witnessed his power. They witnessed his compassion. They knew it. Jesus had the power to help them in their need, but when the sea around them was raging when waves were breaking over the boat. It was nearly swamped. They thought the boat would sink. They thought they were going to drown. And Jesus? Well, he's back in the back sleeping on a cushion. Teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? Don't you care? This idea that God must not care, otherwise he would certainly do something, isn't new. It isn't anything new. In our first, or in, 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 the, in the, 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 the book of Job, we see how God is speaking to a man named Job. And Job was a faithful, God-fearing man. He was also a man with a large family and many material blessings. And one day, Job lost everything that he had, including his sons and daughters. In one day, Job went from having everything to having nothing. And in that moment, what was Job's response? The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. What faith, what trust Job has. He praises God. But 
As we continue to read in Job, his loss, his suffering, all of that begins to grind on him. And he begins to complain against and accuse God not of being fair. Job, excuse me, Job accuses God of not caring. And finally, God breaks his silence and he says, Job, where do you, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? How do you think I did, Job? Did I do okay? Job, who set the, set the dimensions of the entire universe? Surely you know the answer. Who has command over seas and keeps them from flooding over the land? Is it you? What does it mean? Job, I am God. You are man. I am in control. Yes, I do care. In the midst of our storms, in our struggles and our sufferings, may we not give in to the temptation of thinking that God doesn't care. That Jesus is sleeping on us as the waves continue to crash over our boat. Jesus cared about what was happening to his disciples, and Jesus cares about you, no matter what your storm is. As Jesus finished teaching from the boat that the, the crowds which had gathered on the western shores of the Sea of Galilee, whose idea was it to go across to the other side? It was Jesus' idea. Now, if the disciples would have looked at their Google Weather app on their smartphones, they would have seen the storm coming and probably would have not gone across the, 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 the sea. But Jesus, who is the ruler of land and sea, knew that the storm was coming. And yet he still suggests that they go to the other side. You see, Jesus had a purpose for this storm. He uses the storm to reveal his disciples' doubts and so that he can calm both the storm and their anxious hearts. On their way to the other side, a furious squall, a sudden wind, creates storm. And the storm rages. The waves crash over the boat. The disciples are rattled. The, the disciples doubt, that, doubt in Jesus and, and they, they accuse him of not caring whether they're going to live or die. So Jesus stands up. He speaks to the winds. He speaks to the waves as if he were talking to a person. Peace. Be still. And the wind dies down. The waves, as Mark reports, were gone. And there was a great calm. So in other words, the waves didn't just settle down to their normal lapping. It was smooth as glass. Every other miracle revealed Jesus as the Son of God. This one was no different. Yet, in the eyes of his disciples, in the eyes of these trained sea fishing, fish, uh, seafaring fishermen, this seemed to have been different than seeing Jesus cast out a demon or dismiss a fever. This was the uncontrollable, unpredictable, life-threatening sea. And weather. And after Jesus rebukes and calms the storm, just as God rebuked Job, Jesus rebukes his disciples. Why are you so afraid? Do you still lack faith? See, that's what doubt is. Doubt is the lack 
of faith. Doubt is sin. And, like other sins, Jesus calls his disciples out. He calls you and me to repentance. He wants us to turn from our doubt, stop questioning who he really is, and if he really cares, and cling to him. The disciples stood in awe of Jesus that day after the storm. No longer were they asking if Jesus cared. Rather, they were asking each other who this is that is, that is obeyed even by the wind and the waves. It's easy for us to trust Jesus, to stand in awe and to be calm after the storm, to trust him when we get another job, when Grandma is taken finally to her heavenly home. When blessed with a child, when family visits and your marriage is in a good place. To thank him when you're feeling whole and the cancer is completely gone. Yes, Jesus doesn't want us only to trust him and stand in awe after the storm. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to be confident of his care in the storm as well. Even if it seems that our storm won't be ending anytime soon, or even before we get to heaven, we can trust Him. How? Well, there's a very important detail that we often take for granted, causing us to miss the great comfort that comes with it. When, where is Jesus when his disciples are struggling and suffering through this storm? Where is he when the wind and the waves causing the waves to threaten to sink the boat to drown the disciples? Jesus is in the boat. He is in the boat. He's right there with them. He didn't abandon them as soon as the furious squall hit. No way. He is in the boat. Don't overlook that. Sure, he was asleep, but not because he didn't care. He was calm and in need of rest from a long day's work. He trusted the protection and the promises of his heavenly Father. Jesus himself was in control. Jesus is in your boat. And he's in control. As the storm rages, the waves crash, he's there for you. Now this current storm isn't the first one he's willing to go into the boat for you. Jesus saw that we needed to be saved not from a physical storm on the Sea of Galilee, not from a financial crisis, a, strand, a strained relationship, loneliness, or cancer. Jesus saw a need, our need, to be saved from sin and death. So he jumped into the boat. He took on human flesh. He became a man in order to save all of mankind. He took on the storm itself as he took out our sins, our doubts, the unfair accusations. And he died. Talk about being in the boat. Talk about caring. If Jesus willingly jumped into that boat, Rescuing you, rescuing you from sin and death, calming your eternity. Where do you think he's going to be in every other storm? You're doing your very best to provide for your family and your income disappears. He's in the boat. Grandma's long, Grandma longs to see her Savior's face in heaven. He's with you, her, her right now. In the boat. 
You continue to pray for the blessing of a child and some days you don't know how much more you can take. Jesus is in the boat. You sit at home all alone just waiting for a visit or a call. He's in the boat. You don't know what you can do to help your marriage, to show your spouse that you care. He's in that boat too. You feel hopeless and helpless, like you don't have a friend. He's right there in the boat, holding your hand. You're in the doctor's office, holding that tight on your spouse's hand, and you hear those dreaded words, it's back. Jesus is in the boat. We never have to fear. Through all storms, all trials, Jesus is in the boat. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen. We continue on page 8 with the prayer of the church. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. We continue with the preface. Therefore, with angels and archangels, 
and all the company of heaven. We, Lord, and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 